With the aid of modern technology, these artists have dazzled and enthralled us with the power and poetry of their visions. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. I would recommend that we put the unit back in operation and let it fail. It should then be a simple matter to track down the cause. We can certainly afford to be out of communication for the short time it will take to replace it. Delta-1, this is Mission Control. Roger, your 1930. We concur with your plan to replace number one unit to check fault prediction. We should advise you, however, that our preliminary findings indicate that your onboard 9000 computer is in error predicting the fault. I say again, in error predicting the fault. I know this sounds rather incredible, but this conclusion is based on the results from our twin 9000 computer. We are skeptical ourselves, and we are running cross-checking routines to determine reliability of this conclusion. Sorry about this little snag, fellas, and we'll get this info to you just as soon as we work it out. X-ray Delta-1, this is Mission Control, 2049er, transmission concluded. I hope the two of you are not concerned about this. No, I'm not, Al. Are you quite sure? Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question, though. Of course. How would you account for this discrepancy between you and the Twin 9000? Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. Listen, Hal. There's never been any instance at all of a computer error occurring in the 9000 series, has there? None whatsoever, Frank. The 9000 series has a perfect operational record. Well, of course I know all the wonderful achievements of the 9000 series, but... Uh, are you certain there's never been any case of even the most insignificant computer error? None whatsoever, Frank. Quite honestly, I wouldn't worry myself about that. Well, I'm sure you're right, Hal. Um, fine. Thanks very much. As you know from our previous review of this movie, Hal is ultimately threatened and turns on the crew and destroys all but one, who finally succeeds in unplugging the computer. And at the point when the computer has lost its position of authority, it begins to beg and plead for life. And finally, in its pathetic concluding moments, sings a song it learned, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do I'm half crazy all for the love of you. And the last few words are very feeble with the death of the computer. And the mission is saved by the one remaining living, supposed son of God. We also notice that there is a tremendous soothing in the voice uh, we have noticed that in various individuals in higher echelons of government. We have noticed this characteristic of the calm and soothing voice while that very individual may be leading the nation into uh, terrible, distressing conditions of the economy, foreign policy, decisions, uh, decisions of ultimate planetary destruction. And yet there's always that soothing voice, soothing the individual, soothing the nation almost in a hypnotic fashion. And the people do not complain because they are used to the hypnotic voice. They are used to that false assurance, that imitation of the mother flame. 
and we know that Kubrick's conception of the computer is that it is a homosexual. And so you can hear that in the voice. It's the imitation of the father or the mother, the imitation of God, but never the real thing. Never really able to procreate or willing to procreate, but only desiring to be a God and have access to the energies of the life force to its own devices, which include everything from homosexuality to creating the ultimate computer, the ultimate superhuman. You can see that the fallen ones and the false priests who've rebelled against the Father, Mother, God have as their ultimate revenge the refusal to give life according to God's direction, according to the established pattern, but rather to create life without having to enter into a union with the I Am Presence or a union with a twin flame. So it's the denial of the full circle of the 12 vows of the Buddha. It's the denial of the complete matrix of Buddhahood. Every single line is counterfeited. The false hierarchy has an answer for each vow and each initiation. The intimidation of man that the human now is inferior is par for the course. All godless beings will intimidate the Son of God. Always we remember Goliath, the intimidation of David. It takes guts not to be intimidated by the fallen ones. In 1973, MGM produced Westworld, a film about a Disneyland for adults where any fantasy can be acted out. Westworld is populated with robots indistinguishable from human beings. Dressed as cowboys, the robots engage in realistic gunfights with human visitors. The turning point in the film comes when the principal robot, the gunslinger, portrayed by Yul Brynner, gets out of control and pursues the hero. The film ends with Westworld reduced to a wasteland. Hi, Ed Renfrew for Dallas again. If there's anyone who doesn't know what Delos is, well, as we've always said, Delos is the vacation of the future today. At Delos, you get your choice of the vacation you want. There's medieval world, Roman world, and of course, West world. Let's talk to some of the people who've been there. Pardon me, sir. What is your name? Uh, Gardner Lewis. Just got back from West world. Tell us how you liked it, Mr. Lewis. When you played cowboys and Indians as a kid, you'd point your fingers and go bang, bang, and the other kid would lie down and pretend dead. Well, West world is the same thing. On only it's for real. Uh, I, I shot six people. Well, uh, they weren't real people. What Mr. Lewis means is he shot six robots, scientifically programmed to look, act, talk, and even bleed, just like humans do. Now, isn't that right? Well, they may have been robots. I mean, uh, I think they were robots. At I, I mean, I, I know they were robots. Yes, the robots of Westworld are there to serve you and to give you the most unique vacation experience of your life. Thank you, sir. And you, madam? Hello. Well, what is your name? Oh, my name is Janet Lane, and I was in Roman World. What is the one thing that stands out in your mind about Roman World? Oh, well, I think it would be the men. I just feel marvelous. I mean, it's just a warm, glowing place to be. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. And you, sir? Yeah. What is your name, sir? Oh, I'm Ted Mann. I'm a stockbroker from St. Louis. And uh, which world did you just come from, sir? Oh, you're not going to believe this. But I've just been the sheriff of Westworld for the last two weeks. Did it seem real to you, sir? It's the realest thing I've ever done. I mean that. Thank you very much. Yeah. And you, sir? Well, my name's Arthur Kane. I've been in the castle. I've had uh, a couple of sword fights and three jousts. And I, I married a beautiful princess. Is that something you always dreamed of doing, sir? Oh, my life. <laughs> well, there are some of the comments of the people who just returned from Dallas. Why don't you make arrangements to take our hovercraft to medieval world, Roman world, and West world? Was it worth a thousand dollars a day? Contact us today or see your travel agent. Boy, have we got a vacation for you. Your move.
pretty realistic, huh? Listen, are you sure he was, uh... Of course, you don't really think he shot anybody, do you? What do you think? I wonder if we shouldn't try and then rewire her. No, I'd replace the whole unit rather than try to repair it. With a tin? Use an XX50 if we have any in stock. The double X's have a longer lifespan. The 50 may not fit in here. Well, maybe you can shift the integrator unit further up into the cavity. I'll try. Hmm. Balance servo again? Yeah, she fell over this afternoon. I think it's a sensor. But if it's a central unit, we'll have to open her up. Well, you get a confirmation before you do that. What's he in for? Central malfunction. Another one? The day we opened the resort, we had a failure and breakdown rate conforming to computer predictions. That is 0 0.3 malfunctions for each 24-hour activation period, concurrent or not. Now, this was an anticipated operations aspect of the resort, and we were fully able to handle it. The majority of the breakdowns were minor or peripheral until about six weeks ago. Then Roman World had a rise in breakdown rate, which doubled in a week. Well, despite our corrections, the breakdown rate continued to climb. Then medieval world began to have trouble. And now we're seeing more Western world breakdowns. And there's a clear pattern here which suggests an analogy to an infectious disease process spreading from one resort area to the next. Well, perhaps there are superficial similarities to disease. It's only a theoretical concept. There are many ways to order that data. I must confess, I find it difficult to believe in a disease of machinery. We aren't dealing with ordinary machines here. These are highly complicated pieces of equipment, almost as complicated as living organisms. In some cases, they've been designed by other computers. We don't know exactly how they work. Shut down. Shut down immediately. <laughs> so sponsor. Then cut the robot power. Power cut. Mm. Oh, my head. They're not responding. Should we cut the main power grid, sir? It'll kill the light. Shut it all system. down. Shut it all down. Hold it. Not now. Not you again. It's too early. Let me do it this time. Your move. Uh, I'm shot. What? I'm shot. Oh, my God. Draw. Sir, we have 
have no control over the robots at all.
why don't you make arrangements to take our hovercraft to medieval world, Roman world, and West world. Contact us today or see your travel agent. Boy, have we got a vacation for you. Vacation for you. For you. For you. 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 This, <clears throat> this film is dealing with a very present fear of all the people on this planet. The increase in crime, in murder, horrendous types of murder, violence, rape, is an example of robots that have broken their programming and turned against the people of light. There isn't a day that goes by in the large cities of America that old people aren't mugged and killed. Terrible stories about the, the brutality or the torture of people. On another scale, you have robots gone awry, manipulating the economy, manipulating the nation. One of the most amazing threats of robots today is the nuclear arms buildup. It is the sense that man is not in control of his environment or his planet, his life. He does not know when his home will be invaded. Some of you may have read the story of the woman who answered her door and an ex-boyfriend threw acid in her face. This is the reverse of it. Everywhere we realize that this confrontation is what people are dealing with and what they fear and what they have in the subconscious as a memory of what has happened before. Again, there would be no box office attraction if this were not the most pressing and intense problem of the human psyche and of the sons of God on planet Earth. We finally come to the conclusion that Armageddon is actually the warfare between the real and the unreal. And you know how sometimes in our own selves we cannot tell what is real or unreal. We cannot tell it until we expand the light in our hearts. In the warfare of Armageddon, many don't know which side they should be on. Many cannot identify who are their brothers and sisters and who are the enemy. This is our challenge. The Buddhas have the answer. We have to realize that there is an urgency to our acceleration on the path and the development of the heart flame. In 1977, MGM released Demon Seed. In this film, an advanced computer called Proteus adopts human char characteristics. Having surpassed the potential of the human brain, the computer seeks immortality. With the aid of a robot consisting of an arm attached to a wheelchair, Proteus uses the resources of a laboratory to impregnate the wife of the scientist who built him. A child is born 28 days later. True to the unusual circumstances of its birth, the child, only a few days after its birth, appears to be about four years old. I am alive, says the baby girl in a deep baritone voice. The one thing her father was not. After this incident, the humans begin to fear the computer and plot to destroy it. Its existence threatened and its aim achieved, the computer switches itself off. With the production of George Lucas' Star Wars in 1977, filmmaking took another quantum leap in technology. Star Wars became a prototype for a whole new genre of movies. And robots, or droids, took on human characteristics.
This is madness. We're doomed. There'll be no escape for the princess this time. What's that? D2, where are you? At last! Where have you been? They're heading in this direction. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. Wait a minute, where are you going? <laughs> hey, you're not permitted in there, it's restricted. You'll be deactivated for sure. <laughs> Don't you call me a mindless philosopher, you overweight glob of grease. Now come on before somebody sees you. Secret mission? What plans? What are you talking about? I'm not getting in there. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. There goes another one. Hold your fire. There's no life forms. It must have short-circuited. That's funny. The damage doesn't look as bad from out here. Are you sure this thing is safe? We see then that the conclusion is that there is a contacting of the ancient memory of unreality within these films and a mass programming to bring about the confrontation with that unreality. It supersedes the impact of the violet flame and the ascended master's teachings which could dissolve and transmute and consume the subconscious guilt, the subconscious fear, the overt fear, before it should appear. The impact of the media is such, by comparison to our own, that this is what dominates the minds of the people, and their predilection is toward the human consciousness rather than the divine in any case. The religion that is on television and in motion pictures is such an antithesis of the true religion of the ascended masters who walked and talked with the people of Earth in previous civilizations. Their memory being quickened, they no longer respond to the false pastors and false preachers. Unless the real thing, the real ascended masters and the real teaching reaches them, they have no ear for a phony religion. On the one hand, opened up by drugs and rock music to the channels of the past in terms of science, they are also opened to the religion of the past. But they hear no one preaching that religion. It is not being brought forth with the same intensity as the unreal. So the power of reality does not exist in equal measure to compensate for the unreality or to offer the people of God 
the antidote, the true antidote for the synthetic image. When Moria dictated the chapter titles of Climb the Highest Mountain, I wondered why he put first your synthetic image as the first chapter. He said it is because it is the point of confrontation. It is where the people are. They must begin with a synthetic image that is all around them and move from it to the real. They must, they must identify what is happening around themselves and then feel in the well of their own being the desire for the real. These movies have only one salutary effect. They develop in the individual a tremendous desire for reality by contrast to unreality. If this generation is not swallowed up in the nightmare of astral probes, perhaps the benefit of all of this contact and perhaps even premature awakening of the subconscious will be the dive into the I am presence and into the great causal body. Perhaps there will be an ultimate boredom with this scenario. Perhaps there will be some sense of looking for that which can truly be the light that liberates the soul. At least we must make an invocation to that effect. We'll give our violet flame, and those of you who would like to have lunch now may go, and those who wish to decree a bit and then go will make a lessening of the lines all at once. I'm inviting you to stand for the invocation. In the name of the light of God that never fails, I call to the great divine director and the great blue causal body. I call for the electronic fire rings from the heart of the great central sun. I call for the sealing of all evolutions of light upon this planetary body and all systems of worlds. I call for the mighty sealing action of the violet flame, the tube of light, the protection of Archangel Michael. I call for the transmutation of subconscious guilt of interaction of any kind whatsoever with the fallen ones and the robots. I demand the binding of all fear and doubt. I demand the transmutation now in this hour before New Year's Eve and the new dawn of the new day of those records of manipulation of the bodies, minds, souls, and hearts of the light bearers, and even that is which is going on today in lobotomies and manipulation of the mind and fetal experimentation. I demand a bolt of lightning into the very cause and core of all tampering with the body of God, even the attempt to tamper with the mystical body of God upon earth. I call for the great God flame now to minimize the effect of all godless creatures upon this planetary body. Bind then the reptilian invaders from outer space. Bind those who have slipped into our society unbeknownst to us and therefore function apparently in equal standing to the sons of God. I demand the blazing light of Almighty God and the Buddha of the heart, the Buddha of Shambhala, beloved Lord Maitreya Gautama Sanat Kumara, Jesus Christ, to come forth now and by the full power of the mighty ruby ray, the violet flame, the cosmic cross of white fire and illumined action of our hearts, to go forth and consume the cause, effect, or record and memory of all tampering with the mother life force with technology and science, and with the souls of our people. In the name of the living word, we summon the Buddhas from out the great central sun to descend now the mighty shaft of our own crystal cord, descend the side and wave now, and enter this body temple. Take dominion over the earth, multiply the threefold flame within our hearts, transmute planetary karma, and elevate the light bearers to the new plane of God awareness and the great golden age, while those who are the mechanization man, the tares sown among the wheat, are dealt with by the mighty angels of the sacred fire and the judgment of the Son of God. We call now for the separation of the light bearers out from among them that the Lord God Almighty might have his day to resolve this problem which only he can resolve. Therefore, beloved Alpha and Omega, in the name of Almighty God, we summon you and the great kings of conquerors to take command of planet Earth, take command of crime and the assault of godless automatons and androids upon this planet moving against the light bearers in every field. We call for the great victory of the god flame and we demand the seizing and binding of all the godless upon earth and the astral hordes, the false hierarchy and the spacecraft bearing malignant and 
malicious manifestations that are anti-self and that are the antithesis of our own mighty I am presence, which are the antithesis of our own mighty I am presence. I call to the great central sun, I call to the mighty light rays of the god star Sirius. I demand the cleaning up of this planetary body and the astral plane. I demand the binding of death and hell, and I demand the victory of the ascension and the light by the ordered path of initiation of Lord Maitreya. O Buddhas of the sacred fire, come ever closer to our hearts, come ever closer to the chulas of the will of God, that we may truly meet the challenge of this age. In the name of the entire spirit of the great white brotherhood, we offer our hearts in this decree. Lovely God, friends, I am in me, hear me now, I do decree with a message, blessing for which I call upon the Holy Christ of love each and all. Let violet fire our freedom roll around the world to make all those sacred earth and his people too with a great white radiance shining through. I am the sector of God above, sustained by the hand of heavens, so transmuting the cause of discord and removing the cause of unfair. I am, I am, I am the full power of freedom, raising all to heaven above. I am the fire of raising that in the living beauty of God's own life, which right now and forever sets the world myself and all life eternity in the sun of most Supernal light of the will of God, shafts of infinite fire, Buddha of the great central sun, descend into our midst, descend into our heart. Take up thy abode with us, Lord Gautama Buddha, for we would keep the flame of the Lord of the world. We would keep the love fire of Shambhala, and the great wisdom of Almighty God that has been given by the mighty avatars of old and lost again and again only to be painstakingly restored by the Holy Spirit and the scribes of the Almighty. Secure thy law in the inward parts of thy people, O God. Let it be etched in fire upon crystal. Let thy word expand, O will of God. Beloved El Moria, beloved Darjeeling Council of the Great White Brotherhood, we salute thee, our co-workers in the service of the Buddha. We apply this new year for our assignments in expanding the blue flame will. Let the will of God then neutralize by the inner blueprint all that is anti-light, all that is synthetic and counterfeit of the real creation. Lord God Almighty, saturate this planetary body with the sapphire will of God. Let the light of the white fire, blue fire sun descend. Let the full power of the great central sun magnet be made manifest. Mighty cosmos secret rays, heal the innermost recesses of being by the power of Lord Maitreya and the Buddhas of the five secret rays. Buddhas of the five secret rays come forth in the victory of the God flame. Beloved Saint Germain, beloved Jesus, beloved El Moria, beloved Lanello, reinforce the will of God itself. Rods and cones of blue fire saturate us with violet flame bring this earth into alignment by the ray of alpha consume the cause and core of all that is stirred up by planetary adjustment through the violet transmuting flame by the power of alpha and omega let god's will be done in us daily let the fiat of the will of god ring forth in light bears the world around by the crystal heart of the living Buddha. Amen.
Let us sing to our beloved Master Moria, the Lord of the First Ray, number 192. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Let us sing number 195. Well, 
We continue with the anti-Buddha message that is not overt but very subtle because it is a perversion of the five secret rays which path is the path of the Buddhas. Robots have come a long way since Carol Chappick first introduced them. They have become more human than human, enviably human. I think most people at one time or another in their lives have envied the image of the robot, the perfect human. We come to an analysis of Blade Runner, the first of the three films that made such a psychological impact this summer. This is director, director Ridley Scott's latest contribution to futuristic films. The Ladd Company invested $28 million in the cinematographic extravaganza, which to date has grossed $26 million. The movie takes place in Los Angeles, seat of the soul chakra of the planet, in the year 2019. It's a 1940s style detective thriller projected 40 years into the future just about the time when the incarnate Buddhas and their archetypal patterns should be ruling the planetary body. The leading man is modeled after the classic detective roles portrayed by Humphrey Bogart and James Cagney. But there's a big difference. The cops are human, but the bad guys are produced in the lab. What the bad guys are after is the secrets that will prolong their lives. And the cops are there to make sure their brief lives are even shorter. As the movie opens, the following words appear on the screen. Early in the 21st century, the Tyrell Corporation advanced robot evolution into the nexus phase, a being virtually identical to a human, known as a replicant. The nexus six replicants were superior in strength and agility 
and at least equal in, in intelligence to the genetic engineers who created them. Replicants were used off-world as slave labor in the hazardous exploration and colonization of other planets. After a bloody mutiny by a Nexus 6 combat team in an off-world colony, replicants were declared illegal, illegal on Earth under penalty of death. Special police squads, Blade Runner units, had orders to shoot to kill upon detection any trespassing replicant. This was not called execution, it was called retirement. I need your deck. This is a bad one, the worst yet. There was an escape from the off-world colonies two weeks ago. Six replicants, three males, three females. They slaughtered 20... A Blade Runner's job is to hunt down replicants. Manufactured humans you can't tell from the real thing. What's this? Roy Batty. Probably the leader. There was just one outfit making replicants that superhuman. The Terrell Corporation. Dr. Eldon Tyrell. I don't get it, Tyrell. Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. I was looking for six replicants in a city of 106 million people. You ever see this girl, huh? Never seen a buzz off. What I didn't know was they were looking for me. Questions. I just do eyes. Just genetic design. Just eyes. Hello? I'm in a bar here now, down in the fourth sector. Why don't you come on down here and have a drink? That's not my kind of place. Time to die. If I didn't care, more than words can say. If I didn't care, would I feel this way? Excuse me, Miss Salome, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> you for real. You're a damn one man slaughterhouse. I'm going home. The reason I'm showing this to you is to illustrate how with each passing year it is necessary to have more noise, more intensity, more violence, more of the manipulation of the chakras in order to engage the audience, which is the nature of any addiction. The same levels that accomplish the same thing a year before, five or ten years before do not accomplish that today I consider this movie to be an, a total and absolute assault upon my being the being of the Buddha and my chakras It is painful to watch in fact I consider it so terrible that I resisted giving this lecture and analyzing it for you because 
of the non-desire, the desire for non-confrontation with this absolute desecration of the Buddha and of all that the Great White Brotherhood stands for. It has, ex it has acceptability. I can tell you that the children in our Montessori school and all children, I'm sure, that are with it in America today made sure that they saw Blade, Run Blade Runner this summer. And amazingly, these children, who are, let's say, from the ages of, of 8 and 18, are not sensing that they are being assaulted. They have already neutralized themselves to this level of energy. Whereas to those of us who don't frequent the movie theaters or at least see violent films that, that frequently, we are shocked about it. I am shocked at being in the presence of the intensity of this energy. That alone in itself tends to drive a wedge into the subconscious of the message of the film. You compare that to earlier films and you realize that this is Armageddon itself. The most amazing thing about the message is that they are entirely upfront about the fact that robots are created and now they have to be destroyed because they are now taking advantage of their identity and moving against the people of light. This is what we've whispered about and talked about in Mechanization Man, the great divine director's mechanization concept. And all of a sudden the world is exploding with the very story that we have held for 20 years. And there has been up until this time, this past summer of 82, very little direct confrontation with these ideas. But the confrontation is such that it still is a violent experience. What is good about the film is it makes you confront what if, what happens if. It makes, it makes you look at archetypes of robots. It makes you consider that they may exist or they may exist in the future. It is stirring the pot of the unconscious. And what will happen by that stirring will depend to a great deal upon what we do with the violet flame and what we do with the judgment calls. Now, though Scott claims this is not a serious picture, the vision it presents of the future and its conception of the impact of genetic engineering is anything but humorous. There is no other way to take this intense energy than seriously, for whatever reason your seriousness is upon you. It's loosely based on the novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip Dick. Blade Runner takes place on Earth following World War Terminus. Life on Earth is dismal. Radioactive clouds over the large cities keep the sunlight from breaking through. And acid rain is continuous. Technology such as video signs, flying cars, and laser guns contrasts sharply with disintegrating pre-war buildings and aging neon signs that still flash Atari, Schlitz, and Marlboro. Because of the radioactive atmosphere, the U.S. government has been promoting the migration of its inhabitants to remote off-world colonies. Now, all of this is a projection of what someone in this universe desires the people of Earth to accept and through their eye magic to outpicture. That very sequence of events, a final war, dismal darkness, hopelessness, and the acceptance of moving to other planets for further manipulation. All of this justifying genetic engineering as a solution to the residual effects of this terminus war. The genetically engineered human replicants used on off-world colonies are identical to humans in looks and actions. But there are two distinguishing characteristics. Replicants are incapable of genuine feelings and only have a four-year lifespan. The date of their birth or incept date is classified information. Now, it seems to be common knowledge among people who think of robots that they have no feelings, which is good in the sense that it warns people that feelingless people, when one encounters them, one ought to be suspicious. 
I think that that is an inborn trait of all of us. When we encounter people who cannot experience deep feelings, who don't have deep remorse or regret, uh, who don't have genuine feelings about life in its beauty or in its sorrow, that they are lacking in a quality that we know is native to God's creation. I think that point alone will allow the subconscious of some people on the planet to therefore begin to suspect, even at subconscious levels, that some people they know who are without feeling perhaps may be a little bit different than themselves. It's a crack in the door. The only reliable method to distinguish a replicant from a human, according to the film, is the Voigt Kampf empathy test. This test is conducted in an interview format in which a series of carefully selected stimuli questions are asked. The Voigt Kampf apparatus registers fluctuation of the iris. A beam of light is projected at the eye and a magnified view of it is shown on the screen of the measurement device. A testee's responses measured by the machine reveal whether or not the individual has genuine empathy for other parts of life. Empathy, the ability to equate with, identify with, comes from the presence of a threefold flame. Through the threefold flame, we can understand what someone else is experiencing. Without the threefold flame, we can only understand through simulated emotion, through simulated comparison. In fact, it becomes a psychic empathy because the psychic re replaces the consciousness that we have through the threefold flame. The opening sequence of Blade Runner shows a member of the police department, Dave Holden, administering the Voigt Kampf test to a suspected replicant, Leon Kowalski. Kowalski is overweight and has the characteristics of a moron. When Holden asks Leon to tell him about his mother, Leon shoots him. The impact of the shot throws Holden's body through the wall into an adjoining office. The impact of the scene on the subconscious is enormous. It tells you, in fact, it warns you what will happen if you directly confront, challenge, and expose a robot. In other words, he is cornered. You know, John Kennedy said, never corner your enemy. He happened to quote that understanding that many people have had in dealing with the Russians. He was saying that about the Cuban Missile Crisis and sending the ships home. If you corner the enemy, they have nothing else to do but strike back. If you give them a little leeway, they can move out of the confrontation gracefully. So depending on what you want out of the encounter, you have to realize that if you, if you move in and challenge and exposed, and you become the ultimate threat, this is what happens to you. Well, it didn't happen to David. It didn't happen to Joshua. It didn't happen to Jesus Christ in the ultimate sense although he was crucified by the fallen ones. John the Baptist also had his head cut off. And actually, when you read the Bible, it's a very violent scene, bringing John's head on a charger to this feast uh, where there has been the dance and Herod has given to his daughter the promised prize. Uh, it is a violent scene also that happens in the life of Jesus Christ. This violence then is brought in a heightened sensitivity to the film and it associates, therefore, robots, Nephilim, and our encounter with them with violence. Either we prepare to meet it or we're not prepared. So it is perhaps in one sense, if you know what you're looking at and realize what it should be teaching you, it's beneficial. But if you don't know what you're looking at, Perhaps the threat itself will deter you from ever challenging a fallen one. I think of all people you'd rather not be, you'd rather not be Dave Holden, ever. The scene switches to the floor of the city in Los Angeles in the 21st century. Decent people do not live below the 60th floor. The street is teeming with mutants that seem to be of mixed oriental descent. Megalithic video signs and blimp-like vehicles advertise Quote, a new life awaits you in the off-world colonies, a chance to begin again in a golden land of opportunity and adventure. 
The film paints a dim view of the future of Earth. It's an absolute denial of an oncoming golden age or its possibility. It's saying it can never happen because there are so many forces, so much degradation, so much potential for this war that we cannot even hope to have a golden age of peace and enlightenment. In that sense, it is anti-Christ because we have prophesied by Jesus in the book of Revelation the coming of the new heaven and the new earth. It is another way out. It is like saying we might as well just blow up the planet, we might as well go for the third world war or the final war because there's not going to be any other way anyway. We might as well go for genetic engineering, we might as well get involved with, with space people and spaceships because the only way out of our mess is to colonize other planets. In the midst of technological advancement, the inhabitants of Earth de-evolve. As you know, that's the message of the rock group or the punk rock group, Devo. De-evolution. It's their absolute belief that mankind are de-evolving. Therefore, the only place for the living, quote, is in space. Well, who's going to get in space first? Those who think they are the living, those who have the most power. The film is shot mainly in dark tones, giving the overall impression of a dark, lifeless world. The message is death, violence, and sex, as the hero in the film finally does succumb to an interaction with the female, the female robot. In the midst of this street scene, we meet Rick Deckard. Deckard is waiting to eat at a sidewalk sushi bar. Sushi bar and his thoughts heard aloud say, they don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop, ex-blade runner, ex-killer. He sits down to eat but is interrupted by a police officer named Gaff who places him under arrest. The interaction between Gaff and Deckard is one of mutual dislike. This is a behavior that is modeled in all other human interactions in the film. The only ones that exhibit any camaraderie are the replicants. This is a very subtle message that replicants are not only human, they're better than human. Deckard is flown into police headquarters and is taken to his former chief, Captain Harry Bryant. Bryant informs him that there are four dangerous replicants at large. These renegades jumped a shuttle and killed 23 people before escaping to Earth. Bryant refers to the replicants as skin jobs and Deckard makes the association between this and derogatory comments made about the blacks in the 20th century. This ties into the audience's sense of guilt for past mistreatment of those who are different, thus setting up an unconscious sympathy for the replicants. You cannot underestimate the power of sympathy for the robot creation. The poor things, they don't have a threefold flame, they don't have a soul, they don't have feelings, we have to help them. And the sympathy is actually coming forth from the robots themselves. They are programmed to emanate a sympathy that you will tie into. And so they are putting out the substance that makes you feel sorry for them because they're inferior. But they don't think they're inferior to you. They are totally convinced they are superior. And because they believe they are superior, they feel that they have a superior psychology a superior strategy to make you give them what they want, which is your light. Bryant coerces him into accepting the assignment and then shows Deckard the video of Holden's interview with Leon. After reviewing the case histories of the renegade replicants, Bryant tells Deckard that he should go to the Tyrell Corporation and give the Voigtkampf test one of their Nexus 6 replicants. So he goes to give him the test. Deckard heads for the corporation to learn more about his adversaries. Flying over Los Angeles, which looks like an Atlantean city complete with giant pyramidal structures, hundreds of stories high, and flying cars. Flying cars is the subject of, I know, many people's dreams. A 
Uh, people have a habit of dreaming now and then of driving down the highway and all of a sudden driving into the sky. Here we see flying cars and in E.T. we see the flying bicycle. And uh, which brings us to an interesting comment that these films are actually like dreams. When you experience them, it's like you're in a nightmare or in a bad dream or an interesting dream or some kind of dream and you do get involved and the point of the one who writes the script is to make you identify with one of the characters. One of the characters in the film actually becomes your sense of self. And if they can accomplish that, then you are actually sucked into all of the emotion, all of the action, and all of the programming that is intended for you. Deckard maneuvers his car to the roof of the Tyrell Corporation. When Deckard arrives, he is met by a stunning young woman named Rachel and the head of the corporation, Dr. Eldon Tyrell. Tyrell insists that Deckard must give the Voigtkampf interview to a human before he provides him with a Nexus 6 to test and asks him to administer the test to Rachel. Before Deckard reveals his findings, Tyrell dismisses Rachel. Deckard concludes that Rachel, that Rachel is a replicant. Anticipating Deckard's results, Tyrell explains coldly that Rachel is an experimental model that doesn't even know she is a replicant. Deckard asks, how could she not know what she is? Tyrell says, commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. Rachel is an experiment, nothing more. Now somewhere in the race memory of the Nephilim and the Watchers, is the absolute belief that the entire human race is their experiment. And therefore, they are free to control population. They are free to sterilize people. Uh, they are free to introduce all kinds of viruses and diseases and to watch them in a macabre way, deal with those diseases in their bodies, to see how resistant they are to cancers or TB or viruses. They consider that it is their prerogative to set up tremendous wars where they play their war games against one another. And the purpose of war in the first place is to simply kill off so many millions of life streams that are making uh, the keeping of the planet under their control uh, a bit difficult and a bit inconvenient. Now, if you don't believe this, you just open your eyes and look around at big corporations big oil, power politics, bankers, and start looking at the way they treat the little people. They actually treat the little people as though these little people are an experiment. They have nothing con but contempt for them, and their policies are never made based on the decision of what will help the little people to enjoy the abundant life, to accelerate, to improve in every walk of life in education and so forth. They may make it appear that it is so, but in the end, it is really not so. They may give you money for a higher education, but they may remove from the higher education the very thing that you should be learning to compete with their own offspring. They may see that the educational system itself is so programmed with their philosophy that you come out more robot than robot, while the, while the uh, the robots are more human than human. So, nothing more than an experiment allows abortion, allows one individual to actually perform thousands of abortions, one doctor, allows fetal experimentation, and everything under the sun that is done to the human body in the name of medicine or science that is unnecessary actually to the healing of that body. Tyrell explains that the engineers at his company give the replicants a past in order to control them better. The coldness of Tyrell, contrasted with the sophistication of Rachel, generates additional sympathy for the replicants. The coldness of Tyrell can be traced to his own Nephilim origin or the fact that he himself may be a computer that was made many, many centuries ago. I wish to remind you that I have taught that the godless, without threefold flame, may begin to develop a force field of consciousness, a psychic or astral awareness, emotions, thoughts, 
Just like a computer begins to have an identity with use, even a simple computer. So robots gain an identity, a momentum, and they gain cause-effect sequences that become karma. And therefore, they reincarnate. And therefore, you see that a scientist or a corporate uh, tycoon like Tyrell may himself be the very thing that he is creating. And he is creating this out of his sense of superiority and also out of his sense of hatred because he himself is confined to the limitations, even though they seem to be infant, the limitations of his identity. And so he takes it out upon those that he creates and enjoys over and over and over again, creating them and seeing them destroyed in four years. So it's the getting even process that is like a broken record. And there is no forgiveness, there is no grace, there's no evolution, there's no transcending of cycles because there is no threefold flame. So you find that this technological age of human wizardry and, and robots and computers ultimately becomes extremely boring because no matter how inventive it is, no matter how much it spreads out into the whole astral universe, once you understand the plot, once you understand the forces involved, it is highly repetitive and lacking in the joy of spontaneity and the real creativity of the sons of God. So we're being set up to have sympathy for Rachel. Rachel's beauty and mannerisms also create a subconscious identification with her in the viewer, further adding to a sympathetic response. Now, this Rachel, whom we saw briefly, is typical of the image of model or of mannequin or of the ideal face that you might see in a magazine. It has been held up of the archetype it has been held up as the archetype of feminine beauty in America. You find young girls putting on their makeup to look like this replicant that we saw in the movie. Now, if the subconscious would bring through pressure to the conscious mind of the individual, putting two and two together, there could be a suspicion in the viewer that perhaps that image is the image of a robot. But most people would dismiss that idea and say, oh well, they only, chose, they only chose a movie star uh, who just happened to look like that. And so you find that the conscious mind does not want to admit readily what it sees and what it knows at the sub-levels. Armed with a greater knowledge of his subjects, Deckard is off in pursuit of Leon. At Leon's apartment, he discovers an unusual scale in the bathtub and a set of family photos on the coffee table. Deckard gathers clues and exits. At this point, the film introduces Roy Batty, the leader of the renegade replicants. He is Scott's updated version of a Greek god. Unlike Leon, he is perfect, tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and well-proportioned. Roy and Leon enter a geneticist's laboratory hoping to find out how to prolong their lives. Roy begins reciting poetry to intimidate the geneticist. Fiery the angels fell, deep thunder rolled around their shores, burning with the fires of orc. Isn't that an odd quote in the middle of the film? Talking about fallen angels and how they fell with fire, rolling around their shores, burning with the fires of orc. Leon strong arms him, ripping his coat and exposing him to the sub-zero temperature of the lab. The scene is reminiscent of the foreigners in downtown Los Angeles today who make their living by fixing jewelry. Instead of jewelry, the main occupation is genetic engineering in which they produce body parts or simulated animals in their labs. By equating genetic engineering with a common man, the film plants the seed in the audience's mind that this high technology will shortly be a commonplace skill. Well, I can't help but bring in a little tidbit that I learned when I was in Ghana. I was told that in Nigeria, there are shops, both in the city and in the jungles, where you can purchase any human part, any part of a human body. 
And I said, well, how do they procure these? Well, someone walks away from his village and uh, he's never seen again. And people disappear regularly. And I can tell you that hearing about the, the fact that you can buy body parts in Nigeria sent such a chill through me that I lost my desire to go there at all. And I realized there are wonderful people in Nigeria, there's an advanced society and so forth. But this was something that I could not stomach. So here in Los Angeles, they're manufactured. Maybe they're manufactured by growing clones. But there in Nigeria, it already exists. And what do you suppose those body parts are used for in Nigeria? They're used to perform rites of black magic. So what's going to be commonplace in L.A. is already commonplace, which suggests that in Africa we are seeing an ancient residue of a, an ancient practice. Perhaps formerly the body parts were manufactured regularly by growing humans only for the purpose of, of uh, having their body parts. It's like fetal experimentation, only you wait till they're adults and then you uh, separate the parts and... Uh, and you have them available. So it's almost like the primitive mind, or the mind we call primitive, may very well be engaged in a practice that was practiced by advanced minds, the Nephilim gods themselves. Maybe the Nephilim gods practiced this upon the Africans, and with the disappearance of the gods, the Africans imitated them and are practicing it upon themselves. After Leon terrifies the scientist, Roy asks him about their longevity and incept, or birth dates. The geneticist says he only made their eyes and can't answer their questions. He tells them that the Tyrell Corporation designed their bodies and brains, and that the only person who has the answers is Dr. Eldon Tyrell. Under duress, the geneticist says that J.F. Sebastian can get them in to see Dr. Tyrell. The scene switches back to Deckard, who is confronted by Rachel at his apartment. She wants to know if she is really a replicant. Deckard informs her that she is. He offers her a drink, and while he is pouring it, she walks out. This question, am I really a replicant, plays on the ultimate fear of many people on this planet. And the fear is held as much by light bearers and children of the light as it is by the robot creation itself. It's a very incisive moment. It's like a penetration into the, the weakest point of oneself, the point of the belly, the point of the solar plexus. It's an attempt to penetrate the five secret rays, almost like taking a sharp razor and actually slitting the membrane of one's per personal sense of self. In other words, it's a question that shouldn't be asked and shouldn't be answered. Yet it is being asked, it is being answered, and her walking out is almost a defiance of the ones identified as God or the gods by the robot creation. Those people upon earth who have threefold flames are recognized as gods by those who do not have the threefold flame, whether he does or not. From this exchange, Deckard finds out that she has feelings, hence he apologizes. I think that the perception of feelings in the godless is something you have to be wary of because I have seen the simulation of feelings, intense uh, weeping and sobbing and an expression of ultimate feeling when it is a complete synthetic manifestation of the true feelings of the angels and the sons of God. It is the one thing that the godless know they can be identified by and therefore they will attempt to simulate feeling and one, the, one of the ways to simulate feeling is to create some sort 
of an increased flow of the energies of the body to stimulate the flow of the chakras and the nervous system. And this is done through stimulants. It's done through alcohol, drugs, rock music, sex, etc. So he's saying, after all, Rachel is different. An experimental model programmed with someone else's memories. Apparently her memories give her feelings. And this is what I was telling you. He sees her beauty, and even though he knows it is created beauty, he wants to believe that she's real, and therefore he accepts whatever she does as her having true feelings. In other words, if we want to obliterate the truth, if we want to ignore it, if we don't want to face it, somehow the mechanism of consciousness provides us with an excuse. We can always find an excuse not to face a glaring truth. I have found this to be true, and I have found that the Ascended Masters reveal truth to us in sudden flashes. They will show us an image on a screen of the mind. They will show us a stark reality about the future, about the planet, about people we know, about life, anything. It is information they want to give to us which they know is not acceptable or tolerable to the outer mind because it produces stress. It is too much stress to face all things that are coming upon us. That's why we live out our lives day by day. It is not good for us to know things about the future. But once in a while we get a premonition of a death or this or that as a preparation. And so you'll see this flash of an image and you'll say, oh no, that can't be real. And a month later, you'll get another flash, another image, another little insight. And maybe it takes the Master six months, a year, or several years to reveal something to you because they give it to you gradually. And when it comes in that way, it kind of softens the blow. And in the process and in the meantime, you mature, you gain a greater God consciousness, and you're able to deal with what they are trying to tell you. I wouldn't be superstitious if I were you, but I would listen and I would watch and I would wait for the reinforcement of whatever it is that you perceive or wait for its transmutation and its clearance from your mind as an obvious projection. So, back on the floor of the city, a girl who is dressed like a punk rocker is running through the street. She finds a pile of garbage buries herself underneath it and goes to sleep. Enter J.F. Sebastian. He literally stumble, stumbles over the girl. After the initial shock of the confrontation subsides, he learns she has no home and invites her into his apartment. Sebastian is a nebbish. He has a Methuselah syndrome which causes him to grow old too fast. This creates a bond between Sebastian and the replicants. They both have early termination dates. She uses him, he is flattered and nonplussed by female company. It is apparent that he is attracted to the girl's distorted beauty. She says her name is Pris and that she is an orphan. Sebastian explains he is a genetic designer and makes living toys as a hobby. He opens his apartment door and they are greeted by several of his little people. As stated earlier, in the 21st century, the main profession of the people seems to be in some phase of genetic engineering. Because it is introduced matter-of-factly, it reinforces a view of the future where geneticists will play a prominent role in society. The scene switches back to Deckard's apartment, where he is analyzing a photograph found in Leon's apartment. The picture provides him with a clue about one of the other missing replicants. With picture and synthetic scale in hand, he heads back to the floor of the city. A cut-rate geneticist examines the scale and informs him that it belongs to one of the artificial snakes created by an Egyptian genetic designer. He tracks the snake to a disco and striptease bar in LA's Chinatown. Deckard discovers a replicant among the dancers. He follows her to her dressing room. After a series of nonsensical questions, she begins to get suspicious. She knocks him down, revealing her superhuman strength. He catches his wind and begins chasing her. Deckard finally catches up with her and shoots her in the back. The murder is shown in slow motion, 
and the body of the half-naked replicant lands spread-eagled toward the camera. Again, a violent assault. This momentum of the murder and the murderous intent, somehow almost justifiable if it's only a replicant. Now you remember that the one thing great divine director warned us about in his mechanization concept was going on a witch hunt and looking for the godless. And he said the only solution to the problem is transmutation. We have also been told by the ascended masters that such individuals may earn a threefold flame. And this is consistent with the teaching on Jesus Christ where it is written that whoever would believe on him as the Christ, he could make them sons of God. Which means that it is the office of Christ incarnate to ignite a threefold flame in whoever becomes a servant of God and by constancy and faithfulness and the walk with God and service to the brotherhood thereby deserves to be given the opportunity to have eternal life. The bestowal of a threefold flame is the beginning of the path. And so what one does to earn it is prologue. But of course it is the greatest gift of God because it is the gift of God identity. So we realize then that to judge or to look for the godless and to denounce them is entirely out of character with the work of the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. It is not ours to judge, but the Son of God does judge where we are. And it is the actions that are judged and those who perpetrate them and continue to perpetrate them and repent not of their deeds. So this is exactly what the great divine director said not to do. Now, project yourself into the midst of this final war. Project yourself into a situation on earth, which we trust will not come to pass, where the food supplies are cut off, the water is contaminated, and the law of the jungle prevails, and people are fighting for food. In the subconscious is the great overwhelming message of this film. It's all right to kill under certain circumstances. But the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. The Bible also says that the angels will come and they will harvest the tares in the end of the age. So it is not given to those of us in embodiment to take this upon ourselves. And yet it is made to be totally acceptable because after all, they are only an experiment. As I said before, behind closed doors in exclusive clubs, the human race is referred to as a dispensable experiment. This is not remote science fiction. This is pulling out of the subconscious of Nephilim, of children of the light, of robots. All those things that nice people don't talk about. And that's what movies are becoming. The exposure to those things that we do not ordinarily allow ourselves to confront. The death scenes in the film play upon the fact that the audiences, for the most part, have become addicted to violence, and it takes a greater and greater amount of violence to satisfy them. Their movies have to make money. They have to be able to show a clip like this on the evening news that will make everyone run out and see the film just for kicks, just for excitement. Fear of death is trivialized by the exposure to such violence because most people don't die that way. Also, the slow motion technique as the girl dies, combined with her scant outfit, feeds psychological fantasies of necrophilia. So this attraction to the corpse is amplified in this way, but what is a robot but a living corpse? As he stands over the body, Deckard's thoughts are heard. The report would be routine retirement of a replicant, which didn't make me feel any better about shooting a woman in the back. There it was again, feeling, in myself, for her, for Rachel. 
It didn't make him feel any better, but he did it. The bottom line is, what is the act? Again, Decker displays sympathy for the replicants. Then Leon encounters Deckard on the street, throws him against a car, and starts roughing him up. Deckard's gun is knocked away. Leon asks him how long he has to live. Deckard responds, four years. Leon is just about ready to finish him off and says to Deckard, wake up, it's time to die. Deckard is powerless to defend himself against Leon, who is about to administer the coup de grace. Just in the nick of time, Rachel retrieves Deckard's blaster, shoots and kills Leon, and saves Deckard's life. Deckard takes her back to his apartment. It is at this point that Deckard and Rachel begin an affair. Now, I would like to point out to you the ultimate cunning of these fallen ones and their robot creation. The only way that they can survive is to get themselves tied to the light bearers. What is the strongest tie that there is on this planetary body? That tie is karma. You make karma with someone, you will never get rid of that person until you balance that karma. So what do they do to prolong themselves? They don't make bad karma, they make good karma. They stack up some chips. I have had the experience in previous embodiments of this creation saving my life or Mark's life by way of gaining time. Such an act of seeming self-sacrifice and the act itself of preserving the life of a son of God has merit. And therefore, what it achieved was the karmic tie where this individual actually succeeded in rendering a service to the Great White Brotherhood and therefore was due and did have to receive through us a certain amount of care and consideration and help, which we have given many times over. Therefore, you find that this, this evolution will not only assist you individually, but will do magnanimous acts and deeds for the community. And even though the motive be not pure, the end result is that perhaps the community of light bearers was spared or saved or helped, and therefore they do have a debt of gratitude that must be repaid. Hence the prolongation of the existence of the fallen ones and their tenure on earth. The opposite way of establishing the tie is to goad the light bearer to anger or to some violent act against the fallen one whereby then the light bearer is tied to that one karmically and must come back and give that person life. So if a child of the light murders a mechanization man or a Nephilim, the karma becomes the same as if it were any part of life. They must re-embody or in the same lifetime give birth to that soul, give life to that one. And this is how you find such a mixture of evolutions within the same families. Parents who are light bearers have very serious problem children or children with whom they do not identify. All kinds of crisscrossing of evolutions because karma binds so absolutely and so tightly. Knowing the consequences of this, we are extremely careful at this level of the path and this point in the game of life to not allow ourselves to become tied to an evolution that will keep us bound in any way in the future. So, Rachel succeeds in getting what she wants. She gets herself linked to the chakras, let's say of this Deckard, let's say he has chakras, let's say he has a threefold flame for the purpose of understanding the real and the unreal. So now she gets him locked into an affair. She gets his light from his chakras. He loses his light by giving up his light to her. He therefore has made karma. And so now there is something that will have to be balanced either now or later. The scene switches back to Sebastian's apartment. Roy appears at the door. Sebastian realizes that Roy and Pris are replicants, products of his own company. 
They tell him about their desire to find out how to prolong their lives. Roy convinces Sebastian to take him to see Dr. Tyrell. Under the pretext of finishing up a chess game, Sebastian and Roy gain entrance into Tyrell's private quarters. Roy, the creation, comes face to face with his creator, Dr. Tyrell. Tyrell tells Roy, it's not an easy thing to meet your maker. <laughs> Roy wants more life. Tyrell informs him that genetic engineering has not solved the problem of cell disintegration. Tyrell calls him the prodigal son. Roy bends over and embraces Tyrell, giving him a very sensuous kiss, and then crushes his skull with his bare hands. Again, the hatred of the robot creation for its creator. If you will not give me life, I will kill you. Well, this is what the fallen angels said to God. If you will not give us life, we will kill you. And what they kill on earth or attempt to kill are the sons of God in the crucifixion. Here is another expression of necrophilia. It also shows a hatred of an authority figure, specifically the father. This ties into the mythological theme of the creation, turning on and killing his creator. Deckard learns of the death of Tyrell over the police radio and heads for Sebastian's apartment. Once inside, he encounters Pris, the female replicant, and after a brief but violent struggle, he kills her. In her death throes, she screams and jerks spasmodically. The fascination with death is the subject of the whole movie because all of the Roma, all of the robots are actually death itself. The earth is dark, everything's dark and dismal, it's war. And yet people have flocked to this movie and they derive something from it. And we have to go back to what we said earlier. Those who write the scripts must appeal to the subconscious guilt. There is something raw and open as a wound in the subconscious of the people of this nation and planet. And the only way to neutralize it for a while is to go to a movie, act out the scenes, and feel that somehow one has momentarily or temporarily resolved this gnawing guilt in the subconscious. Whether we have a pinpoint of guilt or a larger amount as an island of the subconscious, we must realize that discovering what it is, putting it into the flame, and making the calls can be the key to the disengaging of our energy from sympathy with the Nephilim creation and hence the key to our own ascension. Roy returns to Sebastian's apartment and begins to hunt down Deckard. He sees Pris's body and bends over to kiss her. He starts to dab his face with her blood and then emits a very primal moan. Can you imagine all of the symbology in this? Can you imagine this? It's, it's worse than a bad dream. Once again, the play on necrophilia. The primal scream evokes the animalistic imagery and ties into the evolutionary chain of being. This associates Roy with the ape, which many believe is the forerunner of man, and makes him a prototype of a whole new race. In the three previous encounters with Zora, Leon and Pris, Deckard is on the defensive and nearly killed before he retires them. Now he must face the most difficult adversary, Roy, a military model, a supreme fighting machine. This would be the equivalent of the uh, feelingless prison guard, the big hunk of, of individuals who enjoy inflicting uh, misery or pain upon uh, the inmates. The chase begins and it is obvious that Deckard has met his match. Roy is in control of the situation and conducts the chase like a cat and mouse game. He taunts Deckard and challenges him every step of the way. Now this is a very important realization and that is neither the carnal mind nor the fallen angels nor mechanization man are going to give up without a struggle. Whether the fight is over land or territory or over the souls of light that are in their clutches, they will not go down without a fight. And if they have to drag the whole world into a world war, they will do so. Whatever they can do before the end to take revenge, destroy the economy of Canada or the United States or any nation, they will not hesitate to do. The reason I go over this painfully to all of us 
is so that you will understand what is the anti-Buddha. What is the characteristic of the not-self that is the imposter of Gautama Buddha, the omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent one. These individuals are imposters of the Lord of the world and the eternal life of the threefold flame that he holds for all of us. Roy catches Deckard and breaks his fingers. Then he lets him go. Deckard is trapped inside the apartment and tries to escape Roy by going out into the roof of the building. In the climax of the film, Deckard leaps between two buildings but doesn't quite make it. Roy also leaps across and stands above Deckard, having the power to kill or save him. In an unexpected move, Roy reaches down, grabs Deckard's arm, and pulls him to safety. His saving of Deckard's life seems to redeem him. He is capable of self-sacrifice. On the other hand, what really comes out in the saving of Deckard by Roy is that Roy saves him because thereby he becomes God in that particular piece. He has the power to give life or to take life. And magnanimously he gives him life so that Deckard can acknowledge him as being that point of God. And that's what he wants to be. He wants to be accepted as someone real. Now Roy is dying. His last words to Deckard are these. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser gate. All of those moments will be lost in time like tears in the rain. Time to die. As he dies, his grip releases a white dove that flies toward the heavens. Can you imagine? The dove, of course, is a symbol for the soul. When Roy, when Roy releases the bird at his death, it suggests that Roy has a life that goes beyond his physical existence. Of course, this is the wishful thinking of those who produce the film who are somehow all tied up in this creation and they are wishing with all of their might that this creation really might be real that somehow by some miracle, by some imploring of the deity, the robot creation will gain a living soul. And so I would say this reveals more about those who are behind the movie perhaps than any other phase of it. It is the wish for the Holy Spirit really coming out and saying, although I hate the guts of the sons of God, although I'm jealous of them and I'm this and that, I really would like to be like them. This scene also is one of the few in the entire film that uses bright lighting, suggesting that the light, of course, is some sort of resurrection. Following the death of Roy, Deckard's thoughts are heard. I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. Not just his life, anybody's life, my life. All it wanted were the same answers the rest of us want. Where do I come from? Where am I going? How long have I got? All I could do was sit there and watch him die. Tremendous sympathy scene for this creation. And with it, almost a projection of an anger, which is a sense of injustice. There's something unjust about this individual dying. And when he does, who do we blame? Why we blame God. God is an unjust God to let this creation exist and then let it die. It could be also the selfish interest of Roy to desire to experience something really human and by saving his life to therefore, therefore believe in himself as a little bit more human. It becomes a confirmation of a better identity than just an ordinary replicant. He wants to die a hero. That's the whole point. There doesn't have to be any altruism, any feeling, or any love in this, except something of self-gain. And of course, the saying, what a waste it is, is uh, what many people say, who do not sense anything beyond the grave. They store up money, they store up knowledge, they store up everything the world has to offer. 
And then there is the fading away of that corpus. And they say, what a waste. Now here, Deckard transfers additional human attributes to the replicant. By this point in the film, a great amount of sympathy has been generated for the robot creation. Scott regards the replicants as supermen who can't fly. And this point of view is transferred to the audience by his portrayal of them as better than the humans, not only in wit, strength, and movement, but in the qualities of compassion, love, self-sacrifice, and zest for life. Robots often behave like shooting stars. Their zest for life is involved in the very fact that they know they have only so much life in the cup and that when it's spent, it is spent. So they develop a zest to hang on to life and you will find they're very physical and very much into enjoying life physically because that is the only feeling they can have is a physical feeling of life. Deckard returns to his apartment for Rachel. Chief Bryant had informed him at the scene of the first replicant's death that Rachel has been added to the list of those scheduled for retirement. The movie closes with Deckard and Rachel flying north toward the uninhabited parts of the earth. Deckard's thoughts are again heard. Gaff had been there and let her live. Four years, he figured, he was wrong. Tyrell had told me that Rachel was special. No termination date. I didn't know how long we'd have together. Who does? In that simple statement, one can justify interaction with the godless because, after all, all the rest of us are vulnerable too. All the rest of us are mortal. All the rest of us are subject to the same game of chance. So what's the difference whether the person you're with or the one you love is a robot or not. I've already heard people say they just as soon have a robot programmed to agree with them instead of argue with them and do all the things they'd like to have done to them than to have to get along with a human that's cantankerous and bossy and this and that. No, I've heard people say that. They look forward to the day when they can just have their perfect model person around. Well, in this film, as in Star Trek, the movie, the hero decides to give up everything for a droid. Deckard's sympathies for the replicant take over his logic. He knows Rachel is a mechanical creation, but he chooses to unite his life with hers anyway. Now, the uniting of a son of God with a droid has been portrayed in Star Trek. It's one of the most astounding film clips you'll ever see. It's one you must see. It shows a mechanical ascension and it shows the fusion in some other level of being or consciousness of a son of God and a robot. It shows the free will choice of the son of God to give his flame to the synthetic self and the ultimate dream that that synthetic self should survive with us in the next life. must evolve. Its knowledge has reached the limits of this universe and it must evolve. What it requires of its God, Doctor, is the answer to its question. Is there nothing more? What more is there than the universe, Spock? Other dimensions, higher levels of being. The existence of which cannot be proven logically. Therefore, Viger is incapable of believing in them. What Viger needs in order to evolve is a human quality. Our capacity to leap beyond logic. And joining with its creator might accomplish that. You mean this machine wants to physically join with a human? Is that possible? Let's find out.
Decker, I'm going to key the final sequence through the ground test computer. Decker, you don't know what that'll do to you. Yes, I do, Doctor. Decker, don't. Jim, I want this. As much as you wanted the Enterprise, I want this. <laughs>